right, next up, uh, we have Ryan Woodward, uh, who created the inaugural Women in Baseball Week in 2017. He continues to develop projects commemorating women in baseball, including the induction of former AAG PBL Anna Mae Hitchinson into the Kentucky Sports Hall of Fame, class of 2020. Ryan is a member of the Society of American Baseball Research and the International Women's Baseball Center and served on the IWBC Board of Directors for six years and will be talking to us today about all American generations rookie hit the hit, rookies hit the road in skirts. Ryan, take it away. You're muted though. I'm going to share my screen here. All righty. And I'm going to stop. Let me know when it comes through. I see it. And actually, if you can give me one second, the um, my neighbor decided to start mowing the lawn, so I need to shut the window. <laughs> I'm very sorry. Oh, no. So I can still hear you just fine if it helps. <laughs> the joys of, uh, of um, presenting from home, all the fun and excitement of living. So I think it still beats freezing cold all the, you know, conference room, hotel conference rooms. So we will give Ryan a second. And actually I could double check the chat to make sure we did not miss any questions. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Great start, right? <laughs> all right. He is back. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. All right. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, I just say before we get started, I became interested in the league after the movie came out and similarly went to my high school library to learn more. And there was only one book in my whole library, which I'm sure I checked out every single month while I was there. And it was Sue Macy's A Whole New Ball Game. So now that I'm here 30 years later working full time on women's baseball projects, it's basically Sue Macy's fault and I'm grateful for it. So thank you very much. <clears throat> My presentation is centered on the All-American Girls Baseball Touring Teams managed by Bill Allington after the AAGPBL folded in 1954. So our rough schedule for the next 25 minutes or so starts with a very brief review of how and why these teams were created. Then I'll share some facts and historical highlights that were new to me about some of the players on this team and touch on how they were covered in the media at the time. And then we'll wrap with some experiences that impacted these players. And um, we'll first get started into why I started looking into this topic more at the beginning of the year. Play videos playing. About a year ago, the new Amazon series, A League of Their Own, had been out for about six weeks and was having a huge impact on a whole new generation of fans, just as the original film did for me and millions of other people. Some of you may be familiar with this footage playing on the screen. Uh, very brief segments of it appear in the 1987 documentary, A League of Their Own, that inspired the film. A year ago, I was sharing it frequently for a number of reasons. Um, there was renewed interest in the league. Um, the Louise Pettis Archive that owns this footage have been supporters of Women in Baseball Week since the beginning. So I always like to share parts of their collection as often as possible. And honestly, a third reason, it's in color and I think it's just cool to see. So as I'm watching this video for probably the 300th time ever, I'm trying to figure out who the individual players are. I've probably met four or five of them in real life. Um, but the age and condition of the film makes recognizing anyone really difficult. So I tried figuring out who they were based on uniform number. And I had a program from 1958 that I never really examined too closely. And from this roster list, I learned there were players' names that were unfamiliar to me. As it turns out, a couple of them never played in the All-American League, as I had assumed. So to be clear, I'm not really making any new discoveries here. Um, this information has always been out here and it's covered in a handful of books, but very much in a footnote kind of way. So this became my new mission. I wanted to know who these few new women were, where did they come from and how did they end up here? So 
Well, let's first talk about these teams, how they came into existence. Most of us are familiar with the general history of the All-American League. Uh, my very brief bullet point here is meant to illustrate the arc of activity over its short existence of 12 years, peaking with 10 teams in 1948, and by what would be the final season, just one more club than the league had in its inaugural season. Uh, the article snippet you see here um, ran in a number of papers. It demonstrates just how unceremoniously the end of the league was announced. Now, granted, a lot of people could see it coming once the independent ownership era began. Um, competitive balance among teams became an issue, as well as competing with other avenues of entertainment. My general understanding had always been that a touring team was formed the very following year, but this was the first new thing that I recently learned. And that is that the first touring team actually started in the fall of 1954. Um, so. Most of this continuation of women's baseball is due to Bill Allington, who is quite a legendary figure in AAGPBL history. You can see here he managed for 10 years. His teams were always good. He won four playoff championships, including three in a row with Rockford. One of his touring players in 1957 said Bill Allington was an amazing baseball man. He had played professional baseball and he had coached in the league. And I learned so much from him riding up and down those roads from one place or another. The last All-American season ended in September of 1954. Officially, no one knew that the time of the league would not be returning for 1955. Nevertheless, what happens next was Allington set out on a six-week tour with some of the top players he had managed in September and October of 1954. That's why we see him pictured here in a Daisy uniform with Katie Horseman on the right and Dolores Lee on the left, even though Lee was a Rockford Peach for her league career. Off-season tours were not uncommon for the All-American players during the league with winter tours in Central America and Cuba. What was unique about this one in the fall of 1954, though, was their six-week tour had them playing against men's teams. So after it's clear that the league would not return in 55, Allington again assembled some of the top players in the league for a summer long tour that included some standouts from previous years in the league. So these same Daisy uniforms would have been used. They said all American on the chest, across the chest. And the caps that you see here just um, simply replacing the Fort Wayne patch with the, the two A's that you see there. So here's a rundown of what the first year looked like. The season was relatively the same as the league's. I've read conflicting reports about the number of games played in the year, relying mostly on newspaper reporting. This is not uncommon, but in 1955, it looks like they averaged about 70 games, but one half of them. Given that this was all exhibition play, there doesn't seem to be a lot of serious record keeping either. Um, it's not a surprise. You will see some batting averages talked about, but the main idea for this team was that it was entertainment. Serious baseball, yes, but at the same time, it's a traveling show, right? So it wasn't uncommon for players to arrive in town, be delivered to the game, you know, uh, to the ballpark on a fire truck or take a parade through town to try to uh, drum up interest. Um, you can actually tell from this photo that it's 1958 because of the different style of uniforms. But this, this festival atmosphere was common in uh, all years. So they were known as the All-Stars in that first mini-season of 1954. The team toured as the All-Americans and eventually the World Champions. This is the same team, just the name evolved from one year to the next. It's also important to note that this was not the only women's team touring the U.S. at the time. The Hagerstown Mollies had been touring the U.S. East Coast since the early 50s. Um, they were an all-women's team, which also wore uniforms modeled after the All-Americans, and eventually some All-American players were on the Mollies. The Mollies tour schedule was managed by a man named Matt Pascal from Omaha, Nebraska, who also assumed booking duties for our All-American teams here. So this is the second thing I learned. Um, this explains why the Mollies pretty much stuck to the East Coast during their active years, and the All-Americans rarely ventured farther east than the Pencil in Pennsylvania, stayed mostly in the Midwest and Great Plains area. So again, unlike previous All-American tours, Pascal had two teams challenging men's teams across the country, 
covering twice as much area by staying within their own territories. Um, this is a short, um, where am I? hold on one second. Lost my place briefly. There's a short paragraph in the program I mentioned earlier, instructs fans to contact Mac Pascal to schedule games for a 1959 season that actually um, never happened. So after the team arrives, you know, via fire truck or whatever, the average game day, um, the most noticeable aspect was that the exchange of batteries between the teams took place so that men were pitching to men and women were always pitching to women. This didn't hinder anything, rather seemed to enhance the competition for each game, given that every year the win-loss record was evenly split. It's also worth noting that with this setup, technically every game was between two co-ed teams when you think about it. So I just, I found that really interesting for everyone who seemingly had a meltdown this past year about women playing college baseball. Um, they were doing this in 1955. And, Tony Stone was doing it before them. Lizzie Murphy was doing it before her, so I digress, but that was interesting. Um, as soon as the game was over, the teams loaded up into Allington station wagon and were on to the next game, which could be hundreds of miles away. An April 1957 article reports that in 55 and 56, the All-American champions traveled some 40,000 miles. They appeared in 23 states and one Canadian province. That same year, they played a total of 136 games between the first two years, winning 71 of them. So bear in mind, this is not the well-structured tours they had been used to in the league in large ballparks and bus drivers and chaperones. They sometimes played in community parks, unsure every week where they might be headed next or how they were going to be received. As I said before, these were serious high-level baseball games. Um, being played by this team every time they took the field, even if they put on a show to attract more fan, fan, friends to the ballpark. This is nothing more, most baseball teams aren't already doing, but nothing as elaborate as Harlem Globetrotters or probably what we see Savannah Bananas do today. But it made for a fun atmosphere. It allowed players more interaction with the fans and it also served somewhat as a recruiting tube for new talent. You can see here some of the tricks and hijinks with Dolores Lee actually juggling in this picture. A 1956 article tells us, um, this spring, the All-American unit signed up the outstanding girl baseball player, Joanne Weaver, who cavorts in center field. She is used there because of her sensational speed and fly catching ability. So certain is her manager's ability that he's issued a challenge to girls of every city where the team plays to run a 60 yard dash against Joanne. Uh, the winner would get $25 if she could beat her in a race. Um, so again, it's a great way to show off his player's skills, a great way to interact with the public, but it's also a great way to bring out fast runners who could potentially be new ball players. So regardless of this extra entertainment, fans were encouraged to always arrive early and watch infield and batting practice, which was always serious before the game. So speaking of Dolores Lee here, a 1958 article states that uh, a pregame feature staged by Dolores Lee is a sure crowd pleaser. She takes two baseballs and standing at home plate, throws the balls, one travels to the pitcher and the other to second base. She also stands on the mound and throws two balls, which go to separate catchers 25 feet apart. So I thought this was pretty impressive and a lot of fun. And if it looks familiar, um, Rosie O'Donnell credits Dolores Lee for showing her how to do this unique trick for the newsreel scene in a league of their own. So that's someplace we've all seen this before. Moving on, um, All-American events weren't just fun and games. A fair amount of contests were sponsored by local news organizations with proceeds benefiting local charities or projects. The Wakefield, Nebraska Republican states all monies derived from this game will go to the operation of a local ball team in 1955. Um, the specific game shown in the ad on the right here was sponsored by the Kane Knights when profits were turned over to the Kane, Pennsylvania Memorial Fund, illustrating that the tours did have multiple levels uh, of impact on the communities that they visited. 
So this was the life and the job for a few barnstorming players in the late to in the late 1950s. A Missouri article says the girls have played many semi-pro champions and professional clubs, including the Minneapolis Millers and the St. Paul Saints. Um, both travel conditions were rough. Um, a favorite example of mine <laughs> talked about players checking into a hotel. And in their room, the, there was they found a rope tied to the heat radiator near the window. And when they asked the hotel manager about it, he had told them this was their fire escape. So this was the high-class hotel they were staying in. The, uh, the money wasn't great, but overall still paid better than most of the jobs available to women at the time. Injuries, careers, and family obligations affected player participation throughout the team's existence. So after the first two seasons, there was a need for new ball players. Who were they going to be and where would they come from? So this brings up my original inquiry to who these women were that I could not recognize um, in the program or from the footage that we saw at the beginning. So my intro, initial interest was in five unfamiliar names, which quickly turned into the nine that you see here, uh, with no reason to believe that there probably weren't others that I just have not come across yet. You can see quite a geographic spread in their hometowns or places of residence, and information on most of them is still pretty scarce. Nevertheless, I was pretty fascinated by what I did learn about some of them. Um, in search of common themes on their background, I found that most developed an interest or love of baseball at an early age, no different from their All-American counterparts a generation before. Here you can see Eula Miller, who came from Why Not, Mississippi, and was a terrific All-Around player in 57 and 58. She added in an interview years later that she first picked up a baseball around age four or five and with three brothers for siblings, she didn't have much of a choice. She says, I can thank them for helping me learn to play baseball because they didn't cut me any slack. Uh, Margie Holland from Kane, Pennsylvania, grew up in a neighborhood that was predominantly boys and her father was a huge baseball fan. Growing up, she said she routinely told by neighborhood boys that girls don't play baseball. So she devised a plan in which she bought a bag of candy and went back to the park and promised to share the candy if they'd let her play baseball. They did, and she's played regularly from that point on. About the same time, she's about eight years old, um, she saw an issue of Parade Magazine with the All-American player on the cover and decided when she was old enough, she was going to go out for the league. So you can see some of these similar backgrounds here in the bulleted list, um, playing ball at a young age, usually the only girl. Um, playing with neighborhood boys or male relatives is how they got their start in baseball. So how did they go from sand lots to barnstorming professionals? Um, Eula Miller actually credits a college classmate named Paul Alexander, who she studied with and they would play tennis together and things like that. Um, in 1957, Paul was playing semi-pro baseball and after a game against the All-Americans, he went up to Bill Allington and asked if they needed any new players and he said yes and a few phone calls were made a tryout was held and before long Eula was on her way to Missouri to join the rest of the team which it's crazy how quick things like that happen um by the following season she's being you know heralded in reports as you know the fastest girl hurler in women's baseball today she also can hit at 300 at the plate that same article um, lists a roster of 11 players, but only six had previously played in the All-American League. So where were these others coming from? Uh, you can see here two Iowa girls, Charlene Strauss and Jean Govern, have joined the All-American girls baseball team, playing third base and second base. Um, just like previous seasons in the league, some players joined the team by way of recommendation from friends or former teammates. It wasn't unusual for all Americans to pick up players, uh, even for a short series, if they knew they were coming to a specific town where the talent pool was known to them. So Shirley Wireman here is an example um, who was extended an invitation. Um, this article continues that Allington invited her to participate in the game, but she will be in Columbus where she's enrolled in Ohio State University Summer School. And the outstanding girl athlete will be was studying to be a doctor. So the tour itself, along with pregame contests mentioned before, afforded Allington additional recruiting opportunities. In Ogden, Utah, he is quoted as saying, our gals play baseball and not softball, and they provide a tremendous program for the customers 
So if there are any young ladies in Ogden area who aspire to become baseball stars, ask them to report to the park early on Tuesday. And although Carol Vetter, one of the newer players, is often labeled as a reformed softballer, um, based on what I've read, most of the players join the team with actual baseball experience. So the candy briber of Kane, Pennsylvania, um, who stayed active in baseball, she played with a boys baseball circuit of high school age boys. And as you can see here, she also um, went from Pittsburgh to Fort Wayne in 56 for an official tryout. Uh, the following spring, just days after her high school graduation, she's wearing an All-American uniform as a professional baseball player. Um, it's pretty outstanding. Um, at the end, it says, in September, Margie will report to Westchester where she will be enrolled as a student at the State Teachers College. So this was another fun fact for me because um, she would have been at Westchester University the same time as Gertie Dunn, who was also an All-American player and played for the Blue Sox in previous years. And this is also where I first went to grad school, so it was extra cool for me. Um, it's worth noting, though, that no Black players appear in photos I've seen of the All-American Touring teams, but I've also not found evidence whether this was intentional or not. What I have seen are player interviews that mention a game schedule with a Black men's team um, that was ultimately prevented from happening due to local law enforcement not considering it appropriate. So watching my time here. And making connections to the conference um, through the lens of baseball, I want to take a quick tour through some examples of how the team and its individual players were covered in media beyond just the facts. Um, an April 1957 article talks about uh, Dottie Schroeder, renowned as the honey blonde shortstop with the magic glove, whip cracking arm, and magazine cover face. Now, from this example, you can see. Um, she is, in fact, honey blonde and quite literally has a magazine covered face. Um, what's extra interesting about this issue is that it might be the one that eight-year-old Margie Holland saw and was determined to play in the league someday. And if it is, how cool that they ended up playing together about 10 years after this magazine was released. Um, here you also see a quote from Bill Ellington to reporters that seems uncharacteristic for such a serious baseball man. Is it sexist? Arguably so. Um, is it also him selling his product so they can book the next game and they all get paid? Um, this is also true. Here's another example I found interesting for a number of reasons. It's a Pennsylvania newspaper. Margie Holland was coming to town with the team, but twice they are referred to as All-American Women's Baseball Club, not girls, but women. But then if you look at the caption, it begins pretty Margie Holland for really no reason. Um, of course, she's pretty, but the need to add that obviously reflects a societal journalistic standard of the time that we're probably going to find strange today. And I thought there was an interesting how much this reflects coverage of the All-American League all the way back to 43. Um, you found this kind of language throughout the league's existence, but in the league cities, the team's results usually were just reported as any men's teams might be. So when we see the Turing team's coverage mirrors the beginning of the All-American League in that they are being introduced to the entire country again, not just a local hometown community, and thus the need to paint this wholesome, moral, attractive picture. Um, from there, the bad news is that the coverage could sink lower to downright cringeworthy. Uh, 59 articles says Bill Allenton is getting ready to go east and gather the girls for the 1959 baseball campaign. Yes, baseball. I couldn't believe it, but Allenton says he has a team of gals that plays real baseball. 77 games, in fact, on a touring basis. It's hard to believe a woman can be effective hurling from 60 feet 6 inches. Sometimes they're not accurate at close range in the kitchen. Um, it wasn't all bad, though. Um, not every article stresses, you know, the brains and beauty aspects of a player, but it did get better. Um, this top article on the left, I won't read the whole thing, but um, it talks about Betty Weaver. Uh, first baseman was on her. Wait a second. When she slid in the base, she was completely disdainful of the so-called inherent dignity of the weaker sex and slid on the ground the same as a man. Um, this further asked players, you know, how would they feel about playing in a league again? They were, I would love it. I'd love to give it another try. It would depend on the money. 
So of course this still has some sexist language, but overall um, it doesn't talk about them in the third person. It talks about them as pro athletes and gives a kind of play by play of the game. So to me, it humanizes them and treats them not quite as a sideshow like everything else. Um, quickly, I want to revisit the program I mentioned at the beginning. Um, we'll take Charlene or Charlene Strauss's uh, bio here, blonde haired and blue eyed and just 19 years of age. This was her final year with the All first year with the All-Americans. She lives with her folks. It's her first year of college. Um, of the nine player profiles listed in this 1958 program, I thought it was interesting. Six mentioned high, uh, hair and eye color. Um, two mentioned them being single. Four are listed as attending or having attended college, with three of them majoring in physical education. One served in the wax. One was an amateur photographer. One loves to dance, and all nine of them lived with their parents or families in the off season. So a summary of experience, um, the overall experience appears to be positive, although the life of a traveling athlete is obviously rough. As I've said here, women and girls in the United States didn't stop loving or playing baseball in the 50s and 60s. We all know this to be true, but are often in short supply of concrete examples found in most media on this subject. Um, but here are some of the benefits. It provided professional baseball careers and in some cases extended them to multiple years. Um, not many men or women can say, you know, I was a pro baseball pitcher for 10 years, like Maxine Klein was able to do because of these touring teams. In terms of legacy, this is just a glimpse of what participation on this team led to, no different from their league counterparts. Many women gained the money, confidence, and connections to attend college or pursue careers. Uh, keep in mind the timing of this experience, as well as the number of players who studied and went into physical education. Um, they were working these jobs just as Title IX was passed, and though it was anything but easy, it ushered in a new era for girls and women in sports. And um, quickly, we will look at some examples of our new players that we've discovered. Um, Eula Miller's cousin, Joe played on a team she coached just after her stint in the All-Americans and said she was our first baseball coach. She could hit ground balls and fly balls and pitch batting practice as well as anybody. Everybody knew how good Eula was, so nobody thought about her being a female coach at the time. And there you see some of the things uh, she went on to do after her, um, her brief baseball career. And it's pretty impressive being an educator in Alabama for over 30 years. Uh, Margie Holland is, I've just absolutely fallen in love with her story. Um, she played in 57, went off to Westchester University. Um, you can see she taught at many levels in many places, but um, so she she starts the girls basketball program and track at Bradford High School in 1966 with no funding and support, big surprise. She talks about having to buy polo shirts and so on, felt numbers herself because the school wouldn't pay for uniforms. They also couldn't use the gym because the gym was only for boys. And at the time she's teaching, um, basically coaching half court basketball because basketball was too strenuous for girls. And the irony here is that when you consider that when she was the age of her students, she was playing professional baseball against men. Um, 10 years later, she built this powerhouse basketball team the, was named coach of the year and coaching all-star teams and all kinds of things like that. And along the way, she sues her school district for equal pay for girls high school sports coaches. And it took four years to get a ruling, but in 1978, um, it was ruled in her favor. So quickly again, education, preservation, and participation. These are tenets of IWBC's mission that we talk about every day. And I Remind myself of these when I get to these. So what? What's the point? Research, you know, point of all my research. To come back to the idea that women didn't stop loving baseball after the All American folded. Um, it's a time when softball is really taking off. There were still traveling women pro baseball players in the U.S. challenging men's teams for four years, just like the Silver Bullets were going to do 40 years later. And this was not the only team active at the time, and they deserve to have their stories learned and told beyond just an extension or a footnote of the All-American League, in particular, those players who were too young for the All-American, but whose playing days were over before Title IX. They represent this gap in the historical narrative in which the only gap is honestly how little we talk about them or honor their contributions. 
So I have my list of sources here, which we can go through um, sometime where you can contact me about it. And here's how you can contact me. Um, thank you so much for all your time with this and your patience with the lawnmower nonsense next door. Um, I have to say a big thank you to my baseball families at Sabre and IWBC. Um, it's mostly all the same people, but um, should be noted anytime I come to them with new ideas, they tell me to go for it. And especially um, my friends here, Tana, Sharon, and Laureen have been super supportive over the past year in a number of ways. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, someone in the chat asked the question and we'll get this one question in. Uh, do you know how the women's teams did against men's teams? From what I can tell, um, just most, they seem to split half and half um, when loss. And of course the batteries are exchanged again. So the women are pitching to their own women and the men to men, but um, the games were pretty evenly matched. Um, there are some statistics I've found for the same years offer different figures. So, um, and again, that's gonna happen with newspaper reporting at the time, but yeah, it seems about half and half. Not bad at all. Thank you, Ryan. I 